Our topic today is Sabbath, and I would love to share a wonderful Sabbath story of my own, but I don't really have a good one. But I did find this really cool Sabbath story from the, Me the Reverend Meg Riley, who is the senior minister of the, ch the UU Church, the Church of the Larger Fellowship, was actually the largest UU Church, but it is an online, a full, completely online congregation for people who cannot get to church, do not have a church near them geographically, and for many folks who are incarcerated, it is their UU church. So this is what Reverend Meg has to say about Sabbath. Years ago, I directed the UUA's Washington office. It was a challenging time in US history, marked by the passage of the Civil Rights Denying Patriot Act and endless attacks on vulnerable communities. Nothing that Unitarian Universalists cared about had much of a chance of moving forward at that time, and I was in charge of our legislative advocacy. My staff used to joke that I spent my time reframing what success meant, since it could never mean actually passing the legislation we wanted. With all humility, I have to admit that reframing is something of a superpower for me. So we redefined success. How many op-eds could we get people to publish? How many UUs would gather and rally publicly against the latest horrible thing? How many ministers would go and speak to legislators? What new interfaith partnership could we join or convene? We were like Sisyphus, trying every day to push that boulder up the hill. Though I am a master of reframing and worked with wonderful people, gradually I could feel burnout and depression edge up on me. At the time, before blogs and before we could easily send out a formatted weekly newsletter, I sent, I sent out a weekly email update to people who were interested. One week I shared how deeply discouraged and tired I was. The responses I received back were kind and understanding. Others were also tired and discouraged and appreciated my honesty. One email, though, stood out from the rest. It was from a rabbi I knew, someone who I had worked with on many common agendas. Rabbi Arthur Waskow, who directed something called the Shalom Center. His email, only contained three words, honor the Sabbath. I wrote him back in something of a whine. How could I honor the Sabbath, I asked, when most Sundays found me out in some congregation or another prodding people to take action and organize. He responded, you're a UU, not exactly orthodox. Take the Sabbath some other day. Desperate, I took his advice. Monday became my Sabbath. I hung out with my young child, stayed off the computer, avoided the news, made and ate good food, walked with my dog in Rock Creek Park. Gradually, my week began to revolve around those Mondays, which revived me so that Tuesday I could start pushing the rock up the hill again. <coughs> As so often happens, when I wasn't desperate anymore, when the despair and burnout subsided, I stopped doing the practice that had brought me respite. It wasn't until recent elections brought me to my knees again that the idea of Sabbath re-demanded my attention. I'm not as rigid about it as some people are, prob probably to my detriment but I do take weekly time away from social media, news, emails, and phone calls. Simply to leave my phone and take a walk feels liberating. I am joyful to have brought the idea of Sabbath back into my life, and I vow not to let it go again. Of course, this is not easy for everyone. I am aware writing this that people who are full-time caregivers or, cur or currently incarcerated or holding down three jobs simply do not have the luxury of claiming a day for themselves. I wish that this were otherwise and a full day of Sabbath was possible for everyone. 
Failing that in the most stressful and overwhelming times of my life, I used my superpower of reframing in a way that really helped me. I offer it to you. Each morning I would wake up early and think of at least one time in the day that would be a gift of rest and renewal to myself. It might be literally a bathroom break where I would take my time and not rush with anxiety. Or it might be to focus on enjoying the minutes of transit between several demanding jobs with plans to play particular songs on the radio. It might be holding a stone in my pocket and rubbing it when I was bored in a meeting. I would plan these times out as pit stops and I would center my day in them rather than in the overwhelming avalanche of items to do in between them. I would think of them as the most important part of each day. This really did work for me, while Sabbath moments are not as deeply satisfying as an entire Sabbath day. Framing my day to make them central offered me some sense that rest was, indeed, at the core of who I was and what I was doing. Dis despite my constant sense of overwhelm, I could look forward to and savor these respites. Sabbath moments, Sabbath days, Sabbath seasons, all are good for the soul. May you find a way to live into the renewal that comes from rest, wherever you may find it. So that's Meg's Sabbath story. It's kind of tough to beat that one. And I really like it because it was a UU finding out about Sabbath and how to incorporate it into her spiritual life. And I have to admit that I've only recently begun to understand the Sabbath, you know, this intentional and restful pause in life. I'm just learning on how that can have an impact of the life, my life and the lives of everyone around me. And this information is useful whether you are a religious person, no matter what religion, or if you are not. So I'm going to share with you my non-Sabbath story or my story of cluelessness about this special time of rest that can be so beneficial. I was first introduced to Sabbath, as many of us were, in Sunday school, right? It's one of the commandments, along with the don't kill anybody, don't steal, and don't lie. But keep the Sabbath was one of the basic commandments. I remember being taught, keep, keep the Sabbath holy. Unfortunately, I wasn't sure what to do to keep the Sabbath holy. They didn't tell us that part. I suspected you go to church. That's part of being holy. I also had this recognition that you're not supposed to work on Sundays. But by the time even I was a little kid, most stores were open on Sunday. Most retail was open. Sunday was still a pretty active day. And my dad, being a supermarket manager, he worked on some days as well. So... Even in my little kid mind, I realized, well, how could God really hold that against my dad when he was just working to feed a family? I could understand that just seemed like a tiny, minor infraction. But in my young child's mind, I really couldn't take that idea of Sabbath any further. And I also think of Sabbath when I think about how, as a child, I read The Little House on the Prairie books. Now, anyone my age might remember that that was a TV show in the time of my elementary years. So uh, the books were especially popular about you know, the pioneer girl, Laura Ingalls, also known as Half Pint. Well, in the books, you didn't see this on TV because it would have made really boring television, but in the books, Laura Ingalls would complain about how boring Sabbaths were because they went to church for a long time and they would have to go home and all they could do is sit there and read the Bible and be quiet. And for a little girl who liked to be outside mixing it up and playing and getting dirty, this was the ultimate of tortures. So this also did not help my impression of Sabbath at all. But I think this is something that, society, that people, that even different religions tend to do with the practice of Sabbath. It's something that's given it as a gift of rest. But yet we have to make it overly pious and overly restricted and competitive and how, how observant we are. We see this in Laura Ingalls' Christianity. We see that in Judaism where there's a lot of argument over the level of, of practice of Sabbath and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, but it really, I think, boils down to a few really important things. In the, the Jewish practice of Sabbath, 
it begins when? Friday night, close to sunset. And that time is marked with a blessing. And there are several meals, family gathering meals throughout the Sabbath. And the Sabbath ends the time on Saturday night when you can see three stars. It has a very definite, and there's also a blessing at this time. It has a definite beginning, a definite end, and then a set of practices, which could be many different things in the middle. There's something very beautiful about setting apart this sacred, special time. But on my quest to learn more about Sabbath and what it could mean to a wayward Unitarian Universalist, I went to a book that's really popular uh, among you use about Sabbath. Um, it's called Sabbath, Finding Rest, Renewal, and Delight in Our Busy Lives, and it's by a guy named Wayne Muller, who is a psychotherapist and a minister. And his book is really appealing because it approaches Sabbath from many different religious traditions. There's a lot of Buddhism in there. There's a lot of really good stuff. So it's an appealing read, and it's also really useful because it's full of all sorts of ideas and little exercises that will help you decide how you would like to spend your sacred time of Sabbath, no matter how long or available it is to you. But there are parts of this book that are kind of jarring as well. His point is really, to put it bluntly, that we are messing up our lives because we don't get the rest we need. Now, I'm not talking about sleep, about sleep, which is really important, but I'm talking about the waking rest because we're often missing out on that, and that is not an optional or a little extra in life, but it is absolutely essential. This quote actually really blew me away. Um, Muller says, because we do not rest, we lose our way. We miss the compass points that would show us where to go. We bypass the nourishment that would give us relief. We miss the quiet that would give us wisdom. We miss the joy and love born of effortless delight. Poisoned by this hypnotic belief that good things come only from unceasing determination and tireless effort, we can never truly rest. And for one of rest, our lives are in danger. In our drive for success, we are seduced by the promises of more. More money, more recognition, more satisfaction, more love, more information, more influence, more possessions, more security. Even when our intentions are noble and our efforts sincere, even when we dedicate our lives to the service of others, the corrosive pressure of frantic overactivity can nonetheless cause suffering in ourselves and others. A successful life, he puts successful in quotes, has become a violent enterprise. We make war on our own bodies, pushing them beyond their limits. Wars on our children because we cannot find enough time to be with them and when they are hurt and afraid and need our company, we create war on our spirit because we are too preoccupied to listen to the quiet voices that seek to nourish and refresh, refresh us. War on our communities because we are fearfully protecting what we have and do not feel safe enough to be kind and generous. War on the earth because we cannot take the time to place our feet on the ground and allow it to feed us, to taste its blessings and give thanks. That's the end quote. So it turns out there's this widespread epidemic in our society. You might even want to call it a disease or even an addiction. And it's called busyness. Despite our best intentions, we pile on more and more, and we try to do more and more until our experience of being alive just turns into what feels like one giant obligation. And you know what? Our security, our security, our society encourages this busyness and actually rewards it. It's a mark of success, of importance, of being hardworking and not lazy. But in exchange, we are missing out. We're not as available to friends and family, unavailable for those little moments of gratitude and beauty in our lives. You know, that beautiful sunset or even a slow, deep breath. And our collect collective busyness in our society 
you know, millions and millions of really busy, strung out people together, busy leaders, they do not always make the best decisions. Often they're frantic and reactive, can't take time to look at the big picture. So if you multiply this condition, it influences how we govern, how our social services work, how our, our criminal justice system works. You can't respond appropriately to the world's suffering when you're strung out on frantic busyness, living in a constant state of reactivity. I was uh, blown away to uh, learn that the Chinese symbol for the word busy is composed of two characters. One character is heart, and the other character is killing. Busyness is heart killing. It's a violence against our own humanity and each other. I think the Chinese are onto something there. And in my own thinking, I'm wondering if busyness might be an antonym, an opposite of mindfulness. But Sabbath serves as an antidote to this toxic busyness, this unexamined and frantic way of living. And more than a period of time, Sabbath is actually a pretty revolutionary tool that we can use to cultivate our better human qualities, the one that we, ones we don't have time to cultivate when we're running around doing too many things. We can work on the parts of ourselves that only grow when we have time and can give them attention. Sabbath gives us a time to constantly, cons consciously change our heart-killing ways because we're taking time that is effortless and nourishing and restful and healing, a specific time to listen to the still, small voices inside us and learn from the inner wisdom we can't hear when there's too much going on. You know, when we don't rest, we respond in survival mode, what some of us call our lizard brain, right? That part of our brain that is just can handle, has two decisions, fight or flight, right? There's not a lot of nuance there. When we are living in that lizard brain, everything becomes a life or death situation, whether it really is or not. Small things seem more urgent than they are. We react out of proportion to what is going on rather than act thoughtfully and deliberately. Now, the original commandment involving the Sabbath begins with the word remember. You might think of the commandments. I always think first of thou shalt not. You know, a lot of them start that way. But this one actually begins with remember. It's almost like a given that we as flawed human beings will tend to forget the Sabbath that the distractions are always there, even in the ancient times when this was written. Remembering the Sabbath is a principle in many of the world religions, and it's really held up as a basic moral value. Again, up there with don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. Rest, I command you to rest. But somehow we don't want to take it as seriously as not killing. These world religions somehow realize that there's social and individual good in taking time to rest, taking a spa day for our souls. That they recognize that Sabbath is an essential element for health and for balance in our lives. But yet, we stay busy. And unlike my earlier misunderstanding of it, Sabbath is more than taking time off of work. Because you know how it is when you take time off of work or have a day off. What do you do? Errands? Catching up on housework? Watching the latest hot thing on Netflix? But Sabbath is that specific, that intentional time when we pay attention to the most deeply beautiful, fulfilling, and true things in life. It's a time of mindfulness we set aside to honor the quiet forces that sustain us and heal us. But yet, despite how tired many of us are, we still have guilt and shame when it comes taking time to rest, even though it's a commandment and we have to do it. 
But stopping for rest means living a good life, living your best life. But then again, if you did Sabbath all day, all the time, that would not be a good thing either because it's a matter of balance. Sabbath time isn't spiritually superior to work. They work together to have a satisfying life. But Sabbath allows us to find that balance point at which, having rested, we're able to do our work with ease and joy. When we create sacred time and sacred space during Sabbath, it can become a refuge where we disconnect from consumption, another thing our society teaches us, and accomplishment, taking a break from both of those things, a time that become, becomes devoted to healing ourselves. And because we change because of it, the people of, around us are effect, affected. So if you think taking Sabbath is selfish, you are actually helping the others around you. Anyone who's worked with a workaholic can pretty much reassure you that this is a fact, right? You know how we get when we're tired and over busy. It's not fun. So this is another knockout quote from Muller's book. He writes, we meet dozens of people, have so many conversations, we do not feel how much energy we spend on each activity because we imagine we will always have more energy at our disposal. This one little conversation, this one little extra phone call, this one quick meeting, what can it cost? But it does cost. It drains yet another drop of our life. Then at the end of days, weeks, months, years, we collapse. We burn out and cannot see where it happened. It happened in a thousand unconscious events, tasks and responsibilities that seemed easy and harmless on the surface, but that each, one after the other, used a small part of our precious life. That's the end quote. But Sabbath helps us intentionally counter that waste of our precious life by setting aside the intentional time for restful and life-affirming and soul-feeding activities. It can be individual time. It can be couple time. It can be family time. It can be friendship time. But, you know, the hardest part is keeping the distractions at bay. Other people's expectations and emergencies and our own little internal voices that tell us what we should really be doing. That work, that email, the laundry, the straightening up, the yard work, and those errands that will just never ever cease. But yet, the possibility for Sabbath activities are endless. There is nature, there is play, there is spiritual practice like meditation or yoga, there is reading, there is journaling. Just about any creative acti activity can be a Sabbath activity. Music, good conversation, real conversation, or a combination of any of these could make a wonderful Sabbath. I think the biggest thing for me personally in learning about building a Sabbath into my life is that the work will always be there. And it will never be done, period. Being the idea of being caught up on work is ridiculous because there will always be more work than time. So for me to be able to walk away with a clear conscience and without carrying my working brain into my Sabbath with, with me, which I am wont to do, is my greatest challenge. The ultimate irony is that keeping Sabbath is key to doing better work and being better with others while we're doing it. Committing the revolutionary act of pausing, pausing and saying, I am enough. What I have is enough. There is nothing to strive for, nothing to accomplish in this time right now. I am here now, and that is enough. I hope you can find some truth in that revelation. I certainly do. Our time is fleeting. Our lives are fleeting. If we don't slow down and be more intentional about it, the great gift of living, I have to sneeze, sorry. <laughs> the big clothes and she almost sneezes. <sighs> 
All right, if we don't slow down and be more intentional about it, the great gift of living will pass us by. May we be able to continue to be more mindful, restful, and present on this Sabbath day. Blessed be and amen.